Thank you very much. Thank you all very, very much. He's the author of three back-to-back -back worldwide bestsellers. He's a passionate teacher. What's your cause? What makes you want to jump out of bed every morning and go in and do it better than you did it the day before? He's funny. He loves leading people and companies to their full economic potential. So if you're ready to set aside any preconceived ideas that you might have, and if you're set to learn some lessons from some of the most fascinating leaders in the world, then let's go on a journey together. He's the man USA Today calls one of the three most in-demand business speakers in the world. And he brings people to their feet. This is Jason Jennings. He's a man who knows what drives success, and he wants to share his insights with us. Ladies and gentlemen, please, a big hand for Jason Jennings. Good morning, everyone. Oh, come on, you can't be that tired yet. We need to have a great hour together. One more time. Good morning. Good morning. All right, I'll take that. I think maybe the most unnatural thing in the world is getting up in front of hundreds or thousands of people to give a speech. I'm not sure if I could probably do that. So the way I deal with it is as I'm being introduced, I walk out onto stage and I imagine that there's a big campfire there. And for the next hour, it's not that I'm giving a speech, it's that I'm telling stories. And I said, Billion Dollar Brad, what's a Billion Dollar Brad? He said, you haven't met him yet, come on along, you got to meet Billion Dollar Brad. So we take the elevator down a couple of floors, we come to a cubicle farm that's got 800 cubicles, the biggest cubicle farm I've ever seen in my life. And we finally come to this cubicle and Charles goes, hey Brad, Billion Dollar Brad, you in there? And this little face pops up from the cubicle, the guy who comes up from the cubicle, I mean, he looks like an angel. He looks like he's never shaved. Little pink cheeks, corn fed, out there in the Midwest. He looks, stand up. Stand up. He looks just like you without glasses. <laughs> I mean, he looks just so beautiful and angelic. Like, you know, like the cherub from the Hallmark store. And Charles said, that's my billion dollar Brad. He said, Jason, last year when Brad was 25, he made a $4 billion decision and committed our company for $4 billion. And I said, Charles, why would you let a 25-year-old kid make a $4 billion decision? He said, Jason, if the only people in an organization who get to make decisions are the big, old, chubby executives sitting up in their big corner offices out of touch with the marketplace, he said, the organization's not going to grow. Here's the magic. He said, decisions have to be made by the people with the knowledge. And he said, in this instance, Brad had more knowledge than anybody in the company to make that decision. And I looked at him and I said, but Charles, for billion dollars, what if it had been the wrong decision? He looked at me and he said, we would have had a pretty poopy year. And then he added, think of how much Brad would have learned about decision making if it had been the wrong decision. And one of the things I think that separates me from everybody else is I'm the guy that takes the time to interview on the telephone about 10 or 12 people who are going to be attending the speech. I want to ask people, what keeps you awake at night? What goes bump in the night? What are the stumbling blocks that would prevent you from achieving your full economic potential? Once I hear those things, then I'm able to select content and hopefully hit one out of the park and give people what they need to hear. I have always been absolutely fascinated by your industry. Secondly, when I had a conversation with C.C. Thompson about you, the group, and about the agenda, it was the best delivered and best prepared conversation that I've ever had in my life and I thought I really am going to like these people and then last night, it's like I've known some of you for 15 or 20 years. Everybody is just, well, it was probably the booze that helped. But, but I mean, everybody is so happy. Everything I do is totally research-based, whether it's writing a book, whether it's preparing a speech. 
I frankly don't think that people are very interested in knowing what I think. What I think doesn't count. But what myself and my researchers have uncovered inside the world's best performing companies, that's what counts. Uh, much more than standing up and giving a speech, I think of my speeches as an opportunity to report to audiences on what we found inside the best performing companies in the world. Every one of these companies have figured out who their right customer is and then set out to systematically, not satisfy them, but exceed the expectations of the right customer. For example, this study has been replicated. You'll find it all over my website. It's been replicated scores of times. Two th I promise you, two-thirds of all people who stop doing business with you will describe themselves as being satisfied. Clearly, being satisfied is no longer enough in this maddening world we live in to act as a precursor of an intention to repurchase. It's one thing to motivate people and rev them up, and that's fine. But I truly want people to leave with some takeaway value, something to use in the job beginning the very next day that they can use to do a better job of achieving their full economic potential. How many of you at some point in your career have been involved in the creation of a mission statement? Would you raise your hands? Now, is that a waste of time or what? <laughs> Honest to God. A group of the special people are selected. They take a couple of cases of beer and a cheap cardboard box of wine, retire to a lakeside cabin for a weekend to come up with this damn mission statement. And here's the good part. While they're half in the bag, they come up with some good stuff. I think we ought to be doing this. But of course, the booze runs out on Saturday night. Sunday morning, they know they need to nail down this mission statement. So they cobble together something that's politically correct, will not offend anyone, hopefully aspirational. They take it back, run it through the laser printer, hang it on the wall, print it on the business cards. And let me ask you, say it aloud. What changes as a result of the new mission statement? Say it. Nothing. It has been a ridiculous management indulgence. I think the biggest single obstacle for leadership at every level of a company today is the inability to let go. And as we went out and studied the world's best performing companies, and it's certainly a, a central theme to most of my speeches, is that these great companies have mastered the art of letting go. General Motors. For years, General Motors had had a brand, Oldsmobile, which had been circling the drain, as we all know. In the average year, General Motors used to spend $100 million a year advertising Oldsmobile. Five years ago, they said, well, you know what we're going to do? We're, we're not going to spend $100 million in advertising. We're going to spend $500 million in advertising. And we're going to come up with a phrase that will make people rush out and buy Oldsmobiles. Now, does everybody remember what that phrase was? It's what? It's not, it's not your father's Oldsmobile. Duh. We knew that. It was grandfather's Oldsmobile. <laughs> Who but an old fart would drive an Oldsmobile, for God's sake? And General Motors wasted $500 million of my money and your money if you were a shareholder in General Motors because they couldn't let go of yesterday's breadwinner. I'm very lucky. My office receives about 20 calls a week for speeches. That's about 1,000 a year. I'm able to do 80. That means we have to say no more than 900 times a year. So what do we look for? We look for good companies, good organizations who are filled and headed by authentic people people who are really committed to the development of their employees, of their customers, and of their shareholders as well. Uh, so we want to be affiliated with good people. Stewards are accessible. Do you know that the CEOs of every one of these companies, the CEOs of every one of these companies, including Charles Koch, have listed home telephone numbers?